Welcome to Electron Line and continuing in our quest to determine how they figured out the distance to the stars, the distance to the galaxies, this is everything in our universe. We get to the next stage here and remember what we talked about earlier in a previous video that they had already figured out how to find the distance to the hundred near stars using the angle of parallax. When they observe stars from a position of the Earth over here with respect to the Sun, and then three months later when the Earth is over here, now a distance of one astronomical unit away from the Sun in the other direction, they take a look at the same star, they can measure the angle between those two points of observation, and that's called the angle of parallax. And the distance to that star then in parsecs is determined to be one over the angle as measured in arc seconds. And typically the angle is somewhere uh, somewhere around the fraction of an arc second. For example, if let's say uh, theta was equal to one third of an arc second, so the arc second symbol is like a double line like that, and therefore the distance would be equal to one over one third, which is equal to three, and of course the units would be parsec, where a parsec is 3.26 light years, so it would be about 10 light years. So they were actually able to, to figure out the distance to the nearest 100 stars. Now once you know the distance to the star and you know the apparent magnitude or the apparent brightness of the star, you, you measure how bright the star is, you can actually figure out how bright the star really is, not the way it appears to us but the way it really is. You can actually figure out the luminosity of the star. Well they did that, well who did that? Well it turns out there are two individuals, Hertzsprung and Russell. Hertzsprung was a Danish astronomer, Russell was an American astronomer and independently they probably didn't know from one another that they were doing this, they began to come up with this idea to try and plot the actual luminosity, the actual brightness of stars with respect to their color. And um, also they were able to figure out the actual brightness of the stars by measuring the distance using the angle of parallax. So they did that and they began to plot the, the results on a, on a chart where on the vertical axis it indicates the luminosity of the star, the actual luminosity, not the way it appeared to us, but the way it actually was, knowing how far the star was, they could figure that out, and also versus the color of the star, and of course we have already learned that with Wien's law, the color of the star is associated with the temperature of the star, which is associated with the wavelength of the, of the radiation that's being emitted uh, from those stars, anywhere from 400 to 700 nanometers, depending on it's a, if it's a blue star or a red star. Now when they began to plot those dots on the chart, each dot representing a star, and so they came up with about 100 dots, they saw something extremely interesting. So they started putting the dots down, and to their surprise, as they were developing this, the dots all appeared to be in a line. And so imagine they ended up with 100 dots, vast majority of them were like this, and some of them were over there. And that's the result they ended up with. Something extremely interesting. But first of all, they didn't know what this was, why there were some stars there. Now obviously, remember if you, th if you understand the chart here, the higher you are on the chart, the brighter the star is. The lower you are on the chart, the dimmer the star is. And here I had a bunch of stars that were very hot on the surface, white is in color, but very, very dim, much less dim uh, or lo much less bright than the sun because this represents the brightness of our sun. So if this is equal to one, that means it's a star just like our sun with the same brightness as our sun. As it turned out, if you draw a line over here and then draw the line down here, notice that a sun, our sun, would appear about there on that chart. That's kind of interesting, so that, that shows that of the 100 nearest stars, the Sun was one of the brightest of those 100. There were only about 5 or 6 stars that were brighter than the Sun, and all the other stars were less bright than the Sun. The vast majority of the stars were either of the orange or red type, and very few were yellow, and there was only about one or two or so that were actually white stars, except for the ones that were down here. They were whitish in color, but they were very, very dim. But this was a very interesting result because what they're seeing here is that there's a general, and let me use a different color here so we can see this, there's a general relationship between the color of the star, the temperature of the star, and the brightness of the star. Now when they started looking at this we already knew that the 
amount of luminosity of a star depends on two things. It depends on the size of the star and it depends on the temperature of the star. But this increase from red to orange to yellow, notice that it goes from 3,000 to 4,000 to 6,000 degrees uh, Kelvin on the surface of the star. Notice that that alone would not account for the vast, the large amount of increase in the luminosity. Remember that if you go from a red star to a yellow star, and if the size of the star stays the same, this star should only be 16 times as bright as this one, because according to the Stefan Boltzmann's law, it's proportional, right, the, the luminosity is going to be proportional to the temperature to the fourth power. So if you double the temperature from 3,000 to 6,000, if you take 2 to the fourth power, that's only 16. So the, the, the curve should have looked like this rather than like this if the only result was that the star was getting hotter, not larger. So then the result also indicated that not only was the star getting hotter as you go to the left on that diagram, they're also getting larger. So the stars are becoming larger and larger and larger as they went from red stars to orange stars to yellow stars to white stars. So we can graphically indicate that. So what Hersprung and Russell began to realize is that these were probably pretty small stars. And then as you go further and further and further up this chart here, the stars got to be bigger and bigger and bigger. So that was a tremendous discovery. Here they could see that there was a, a relationship that was able to be determined between the color and the size of the star and therefore also the luminosity of the star. That was a huge discovery. Now back to these stars. What were these stars? Well, they were white, but since they were not very luminous, they had to be very, very small. So these were termed to be very tiny little stars. And so they named these little stars the white dwarf stars. In a later video, we'll learn what these uh, white dwarf stars. We um, or simply white dwarfs, they're called white dwarfs. Uh, we'll learn later what those are, but at least this was the important part of the diagram. So what did that imply? This had a tremendous impact in our ability to determine the distance to stars. Why is that? Because let's say we're now looking at a star that is uh, much further away than the hundreds near stars. Remember, this technique was only good out to about 15 or 16 light years, so let's say there's a star that's 50 or 100 light years away, and we're measuring the brightness of the star. And then we're wondering, well, how far is that star? Well, unless we know the real brightness, the real luminosity of the star, we couldn't figure out that distance. However, if we say, well, wait a minute, if we can take a look at that star and we can measure the color of that star, we can then place it somewhere on this diagram. And so let's say that we ended up with uh, indicating that it was somewhere between the orange and the yellow star and say, okay, it must be right there. All right, then we would be able to tell that by the wavelength of the light coming towards us. And then we'd go ahead and move this over here and we would be able to determine the luminosity of the star, not just the way it appears to us, but the way it actually is, the real luminosity of the star. So now we would have the real luminosity of the star, we would have the apparent luminosity, and with those two indicators, with those two results, we could actually find the distance of the star. Remember, there's three things you need to know. You need to know the distance of the star. You need to know the actual luminosity. Uh, I'll just go ahead and put it like that. And the apparent luminosity, the, how bright it actually or how bright it appears to us. If so, if you know the apparent luminosity, you know the actual luminosity, you can calculate the distance to the star. Or if you know the apparent luminosity, you know the distance, you can figure out the actual luminosity and so forth. As long as you know two items, you can always calculate the, the third. But the key here is that we're now able to calculate the distance of stars knowing this relationship from this diagram. This diagram forevermore has now been called the HR diagram. So that's the name. And notice that H and R are the, two, are the first letters of Hertzsprung and Russell, the two that invented this diagram, of course. Since then, we've vastly expanded on this diagram with gaining more and more knowledge, and you'll see in the next video how we've been able to use that in various ways. But the HR diagram was now actually able to give us the tools necessary to figure out the distance of stars well beyond 15, 16 light years to thousands of light years, and it opened up a whole new concept, a whole new understanding to the universe. And many more, many more uh, discoveries were made based upon our understanding of stars. So let me show you in the next videos why that was so important.